Barbie, Barbie. Got my name up in your mouth, you don't know no better Don't forget I'm from the south, yeah, I got them headers You watching everything I do, studying all of my moves Wish you could do what I do Hello, litigators and opinionators. Court is now in session. Just a disclaimer, all content is alleged or an opinion or just for the purposes of entertainment. And all persons discussed during this live are presumed innocent and no information discussed is considered legal advice. Now let's get into this, guys. We talked about this tragedy before when we were discussing the lovely teacher in Virginia who was shot by her six year old student. Well, y'all, some more information has come out about this case and I gotta tell you, it is very, very disturbing, okay? The troubled six year old student who shot his teacher, Abigail, oh my gosh, guys, he reportedly told another teacher he wanted to set her on fire. Can you believe this? How does a six-year-old know how to do all this violence unless he was taught it? I get it, I get it, I get it. The parents said that he had some behavioral issues or an acute disorder. But still, I mean, the kid had to learn violence somewhere. I mean, after all, the parent had a whole gun and house. So I'm just saying, I feel like this kid was taught that violent reaction, even though, yes, I understand he had an acute disorder, but still. Um, and he's, he's not only did he say he wanted to see her be set on fire, he wanted to watch her die, guys. The teachers union claims they reached out to administration for help, but they were dismissed. And this is supposedly a blurred out picture of him. I don't know. This is from, this photo was from Neighborhood Talk, y'all. They over here, they posted that photo. I don't even know if it really is him, but that was the photo they posted of him, y'all. It is absolutely disturbing, okay? Disturbing. Let's see what Neighborhood Talk had to say about this. And I just find this so disturbing that a little kid would even know about stuff like this. Wanted to see her be set on fire. And what's more disturbing is how this teacher repeatedly reached out for help and was ignored all the time. So, oh my gosh. If you guys remember this case, we talked about it a few weeks ago when, we report, when I talked about the six-year-old student who shot his teacher, Abigail inside the school well you guys this child was troubled for some time now way before the shooting even took place and that's the problem the problem is the kid there were warning signs i really feel yes now abigail has a very strong 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 case for a lawsuit i mean it's so strong it's not even funny okay so um According to Washington Post, several teachers of Rich Neck Elementary had complained, complained y'all to the administration about the young boy's behavior, but nothing was ever done about it. This is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Teachers sent multiple online messages to Newport News Superintendent George Parker III explaining how Abigail Werner, the victim of the shooting, Ask for help with the boy time after time to no avail. They said she asked for help. No school staff member wrote in, oh, sorry. They said that she asked for help. One school staff member wrote in the chat. Several times another person added. This is like a lawsuit waiting to happen because she repeatedly told the school and they did not listen to her. She had asked for support with the boy and expressed concerns about his behavior. She wrote on, um, and teachers wrote online messages to the Newport News and that she, um, the child was known to throw furniture and other objects in the classroom. Once wrote a note to a teacher in which he told her he hated her. He said he wanted to set her on fire, y'all. This is insane. 
to kill her. He wanted to, I mean, how does a six year old know this stuff unless he was at home watching violent stuff on, on TV and maybe heard, overheard a lot of violence in that household. Now they're saying he had an acute disability, but I don't know if this, some child is born violent like that. I, I highly doubt that, okay? He might've had some, a disability, but I don't think that just automatically makes him a violent person. Well, you know, it just depends on what kind of a disability it is also. They didn't really specify the actual disability. The teachers union told the Washington Post and when she brought the disturbing letter to school administrators, they told her to drop it, according to a teacher who talked about it. She tried to bring this to the teacher. She even complained all the way up to the very minute this happened to her when she went out to talk about it and it was just ignored. It is unclear when the threat was made, the outlet noted. Another time, the student managed to block a teacher and other students from leaving their classroom, y'all, by barricading the doors. They were only freed after the teacher banged on the door. A colleague across the hall managed to get it open, y'all. My gosh. And y'all already know who's Warner, but I'll show you a picture of her again, just in case everybody forgot. This case has been a few weeks ago, so I'm pretty sure people have already forgotten who we're referring to. This is just so sad. I mean, the more we hear about the story, the more disturbing it is, you know? Who does this? And not only that, I just feel like the parents have some form of responsibility. They're claiming up and down that they put this uh, gun in a secured locked area. That is a lie in my opinion, because that kid wouldn't have got a hold of it. They clearly was negligent. Now they're lying in my opinion. They need some deep evidence because the kid wouldn't have been able to, they said they had a trigger lock on the gun. If they had a trigger lock, this wouldn't have happened. How's the, a six year old kid supposed to get a trigger lock off? Make it make sense, okay? Oh, and how they learn how the kid learned how to uh, the kid wouldn't have known how to load a gun also so the gun would have already been loaded meaning by the parents and they just left a loaded gun for the child to obtain um but here's a photo of the young lady that we were talking about before the sweet young lady who was shot she's only 25 years old but this the sad part is she repeatedly told the authority she repeatedly told her um reported these concerns and was ignored completely ignored like oh, it's so sad uh, i hope she sues i really do she has a strong strong ground for that so the washington post obtained text from the school employees that revealed alarming details about the boy's behavior as we talked about those and school employees said in the messages that the teacher raised concerns about the boy but were ignored that's where the that's where the lawsuit comes in, and, and and the authorities said that shooting was intentional. The child who was known to throw furniture, he was known to just have temper tantrums when he didn't get his way. It seemed like it seemed like when she put any form of discipline, then he just couldn't. He just would outrage and become violent. That's what it appeared as though. Okay, so that was the disturbing thing about it. And and basically, one occasion, the boy threw furniture and other items around in the classroom which led to the other children hiding under their desks per an account so it was so bad that the kids were hiding under their desks that's crazy the account there's an account also because they were being um the authorities virginia school officials were alleged to have downplayed concerns about the six-year-old boy that went on to shoot a teacher, including that he said he wanted to light her on fire and watch her die. Police said the child eventually shot teacher Abigail earlier this month as she taught her first grade class at the Rich Next School. Authorities have said the shooting was intentional and not accidental, and we know that based upon all of his, his behaviors. Post obtained a message from that was written by a Rich Neck teacher through local teachers union that reveals alarming details about the boy's alleged behavior. So let's take a look at the inside article because this is crazy, y'all. I can't believe this. I mean, we heard some signs that it was foreseeable, but this underlying information just strengthens this young lady. I hope she does not go back to that job because they clearly did not listen to her concerns. They disregarded her and downplayed it over and over again. 
And she should file a lawsuit against them because it's their fault. They knew it. They had repeated warnings of this kid being troublesome and the threats he made, and they just ignored her. And now her she was shot because of it. The account claims that the boy wrote a note to Warner, which said that he hated her. He wrote the note, the little kid, and he wanted to light her on fire and watch her die. When she reported the note to Rich Neck administrators, Swerner was told to drop the matter. Can you believe this? They told her to drop the matter, y'all, like it didn't matter. On one occasion, the boy threw furniture and other items. That was where the kids started hiding. The account also claims that in another incident, the boy barricaded the doors to a classroom and prevented a teacher and students from leaving. That's false imprisonment. It's like they constantly just disregarded what this kid did, which made the kid more emboldened to do it. The boy's family said that he had an acute disability and that one of his parents often went with him to class, but did not do so the week of the shooting. So they said this one time that they didn't go was what led to this and this they'll forever feel terrible for what they did. But it's like, you knew your kid had some serious issues. How could you not come to the class knowing that though? I don't understand. The teacher also alleged in her account that the boy was not receiving the educational services that he needed at the school. Well, look at this, all of the foreseeable signs here. The teacher declined to speak to the post directly or reveal her identity publicly out of fear of retaliation. So this is a teacher coming out anonymously. It's not Abigail, it's just another teacher who's anonymous who witnessed all of this. So right there, Abigail has a potential witness if that witness is willing to testify in court because that would be a potential witness to show severe lack of um, effort on the end of the school. The outlet also obtained text messages, between, text messages between school employees and Newport News Superintendent George Parker III following the shooting, which say that Zwerner had requested to requested help to deal with the young student. See, she asked for help. She did all that she could do. She did all the right things. It was the school that failed her. She asked, she had asked for help. One staffer wrote about Zwerner with another school official responding in agreement that she had done so several times. Wow, so it looks like Abigail has several other staff members and teachers that have witnessed that she repeatedly had tried to seek help for this student. So this was all foreseeable. Other school officials responded by saying that she had requested help two hours before, as well as all year. Do you see that? Two hours be prior. Two hours prior to the shooting, she asked for help. All the way up to then, and they just ignored her. They downplayed it. And as well as all year. Yeah, she needs, to law she needs a lawsuit. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we see a press conference where she, she sues when she gets better. The messages do not provide any further details about Zwerner's request for assistance. Since the shooting, other details have emerged, suggesting that school officials might have fallen short in addressing concerns about the boy. Might have fallen short right there. Pure negligence right there. Even not even just pure negligence. It's like intentional almost. Superintendent Parker said, the hours before the boy shot the teacher, a school administrator was told the child may have brought a gun to school. What? The school administrator guys was already told hours before he shot Abigail that he may have brought a gun to school. What in the heck? Why did they ignore this? They probably was thinking, oh, he's a six-year-old kid. He's he's harmless. He can't do anything. They probably just didn't believe it because it was a six-year-old kid. They didn't think in the million years. But you can't just ignore warnings like that when the teacher's repeatedly trying to seek your help. Okay? You just can't. Why is this always on here? It's so annoying. Oh, gosh. It's so annoying seeing this. Okay. He said that workers at the school searched the boy's backpack but did not find the nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol legally owned by his mother. What, so they searched his backpack? Well, then where did he store it? He probably, did he store it in his little pocket or something? Interesting that they said they searched his backpack, but didn't find it. But when did they search his backpack? Did they search his backpack as soon as he got there? I, was just, I have questions, y'all. I have questions. After the shooting, Zwerna was taken to the hospital where her condition went from life-threatening condition to stable, according to the Washington Post.
The bullet went through Zorner's hand and into her upper chest, according to reports. Richneck Elementary School did not respond to any requests. This is crazy. Guys, what do you think about this? Like, this is insane. Do you think the parents are, are at fault? Oh, of course we think the parents are at fault. The parents shouldn't even, they should have been there with their kid. They know better. They know better because they are over here saying that the kid had an acute disability and they're always with the kid. But, and it's sad that the teacher asked for help several times and was ignored. This is insane, guys. My gosh. And he made threats, like still nothing was done. But I want to know um, what you guys think about the parents talking about, oh, we, we didn't come. We didn't show up. Um, we didn't show up. We're sorry we didn't show up this one time. And what do you think about their excuse about hiding the gun? Talking about they put it up on a top shelf and that it was put, it was locked away. And um, they had a, a trigger, a trigger holder here. Let's see if we can look at that real quick. Let's see what the parents had to say because they had a little, a little excuse, y'all. A little excuse talking about, oh, we put the gun up. You lying. I don't believe the parents, guys. I'm, I'm having a hard time believing the parents. I think they're lying. Because how is the kid going to get a trigger lock off? Okay, make it make sense. Parents of six-year-old who shot teachers speak out for the first time. And this was back on Friday. The parents of a six-year-old boy in Virginia who shot his first grade teacher. This is still unbelievable every time I hear that. In class, oh God, earlier this month, are speaking out about their son and the violent incident, saying that they were responsible gun owners who kept firearms out of children's reach. Hogwash, how are you a responsible gun owner if your little tiny itty bitty kid, six year old kid, look how little that kid is. How did your little kid get the gun then? And you put you put it on a top shelf somewhere. That's a lie. The firearm our son ac accessed, a set, ac sorry, access was secured. The parents said in a statement to Buzzfeed News via their attorney James Ellenson. The statement didn't explain how the child gained access to the weapon and managed to bring it to school. The gun had been legally purchased by the child's mother. Police said. Newport News Police Chief Steve Drew told CNN that charging the parents is certainly a possibility. They need to be charged. They're lying. I don't believe they put it up in a secure place because if they did, the kid wouldn't have got it. How low kid go? What? The kid had a little ladder to climb up the shelf? <sighs> Come on. The parents said the boy who shot teacher Abby Zwerner has an acute disability and was under a care plan that required at least one of his parents to be in his class every day. The shooting happened during the first week. Neither parent accompanied the child in class, according to the statement. We will regret our absence on this day for the rest of our lives, the parents said. They knew this was foreseeable. They knew their kid had behavioral issues. And I feel as though I understand that he has an acute disability. I don't know exactly what the disability is, but guys, maybe tell me in the chat because maybe I'm missing something. Even if they have an acute disability, do they learn how to be this violent though? I don't think a kid just, even if they have a disability, I don't think they just start learning how to shoot and kill people. Like it had to be some in that household, the way the house is structured. I mean, they might be, they might talk a lot about violence in that house. I mean, there's got to be something more to this story about how that how he's raised also, I feel like. Because kids, a lot of times, even if they have acute disorders, they do follow some of the, the things they see growing up in the household that they're brought up in. But I need y'all to help me out with that in the chat. Some people might have more knowledge about the acute disability that I'm missing. Um, they, they, they claim they're going to regret it for the rest of their life. I highly doubt that. I think that's something written by their attorney, guys, because, again, this statement was submitted through their attorney. This sounds like something an attorney would put. The parents also expressed sympathy for Zwerner, 25, who was released from the hospital Thursday, according to Northfolk 
CBS affiliate. So she was released. I feel like this girl deserves justice. I feel like she should sue the school and get another job somewhere because if they're not willing to listen to this woman's concerns and her repeated cries, outcries to the you know superintendent and other individuals several times throughout an entire year, and she was repeatedly ignored, I feel like this is not a place where she should work because a superintendent and those her those that her, are her superiors should be on her side and you know care for her welfare. Now the parents said, "Our hearts go out to our son's teacher, and we pray for her healing in the aftermath of such an unimaginable tragedy." as she selflessly served our son and the children in the school, the parents said. I think this is all hogwash. Again, guys, I think these are not the words of the parents. I think this is what her attorney wrote up in the in the parents just agreed because again, this sounds like some poetic language here that an attorney would think of to try to make it look like they're really remorseful. I just highly doubt it because I feel like there's been complaints about this kid throughout the whole year. They knew their kid had an acute dis disability. Why did they choose to not go to school that one week when they know their kid has behavioral issues. And even with the, the parent coming and attending, it appears as though Abigail is saying the kid wasn't getting the proper special education the kid needed. She was repeatedly asking for help and it was downplayed. It just sounded like, I don't know where the parents were during this whole situation, during the whole school year, basically. Oh God, so guys make it make sense this case makes me so frustrated let's read that again to see if y'all really believe it our heart goes out to our son's teacher and we pray for healing in the aftermath of such an unimaginable tragedy as she selflessly served our son and the children in the school i don't believe they wrote that guys i just don't I'm frustrated with the parents because they already know, they acknowledge that the kid has an acute disability. First of all, why is this kid in this school anyway? They should, the kid should be in a, a, I don't know, I don't know, some school where for a behavioral school, I guess, a behavioral school where they can get closely monitored. I don't even know if they have such a thing, but they shouldn't be, she shouldn't, he shouldn't be in a main school if he can't really, he cannot behave safely, <laughs> safely amongst his peers and his teachers because it seemed like he already had other problematic behaviors, for example, barricading his teachers and classmates in class, throwing things and kids being so terrified they're hiding under their desk. It just doesn't sound like this kid is, you know, should be in that type of environment because he doesn't seem to really be able to behave. Zwerner, a first grade teacher at Richneck in Newport was shot in the chest. Now she also has a GoFundMe in her name and she's raised $228,000 for medical experiences. Here is a beautiful picture of her that was shot earlier this month by a six-year-old student. So that's so sweet as students took her picture. How precious, this teacher is so precious. I feel so frustrated for her that she was constantly ignored and it, it took her being shot and literally almost unalived for them to care. Can you believe that? She had to literally be shot <laughs> for them to care. So let's take a look at uh, Warner's GoFundMe. Now that we heard from the parents, y'all, I don't know what y'all think about the parents. Let me know what you think in the chat. This is Abigail Zorner's GoFundMe. And I will go ahead and put this in the chat for y'all if anybody wants to donate. But she has a pretty decent amount. I don't know if this is, I think she would need some more money for not only medical, but recovery and probably while she waiting for another job and, and to sue this, sue this school because the school is a hot mess. So I wonder what she said. Okay, this is her message. So it says, my twin sister. Oh, guys, Abby has a twin sister. Oh, two cute Abbies. Annie Swerner, Hannah, sorry. Hannah Swerner is Abby's twin sister. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful to have in this world. Two adorable Abbies. That is a wonderful thing. So that's cool, guys. We learned something that Abby has a twin and her name is Hannah. Okay, anyways, let's read this. My twin sister, first grade teacher, Abby Zwerner, was shot and injured by a student on January 6, 2023 at Richneck Elementary School in Newport News, Virginia, United States. Abby, my family, and I are humbled by the outpouring of support we've received in the days following the event. Thank you for all the prayers, well wishes, and words of kindness. If you're looking for ways to help, I'm creating this fund to help aid Abby's healing. Its purpose is to cover future living expenses as Abby recovers from this tragedy. And it looks like she's made $240,000 and 127, 240, 127. 
she gonna need a lot to pay for her medical bills y'all to pay for her living expenses and re long road to recovery i just don't think she should go back to this job teachers deserve the the protection and the um acknowledgement of of the superintendent and those in high authority if, if a teacher is repeatedly complaining about a dangerous student then the teachers the school administrator the supervisors all those involved have a duty to protect and if that means removing that child from the class do something but i'm curious what y'all have to say because y'all probably have a lot more knowledge about this um especially i don't know what an acute disability is i mean they haven't really especially they didn't really, you know, tell us, specify exactly what the disability is. Because I know some kids with certain disabilities do tend to be more violent, but they're put in a special class for specially trained teachers who are able to handle those type of violent kids. I have heard of that because I recall um, a teacher, you know, teaching in a special class like that. But acute or persistent disability, Okay, let's read it. I'm going to read this, what I found about acute or persistent disability that I found. Um, and let's see what this is all about. It says, persistent or acute disability. It's a severe mental disorder that meets all the following criteria. If not treated, has a substantial probability of causing the person to suffer or continue to suffer severe and abnormal mental, emotional, or physical harm that significantly impairs judgment, reason, behavior, or capacity to recognize reality. Okay, that is a severe disorder. Okay, if a kid has this type of severe acute disorder, then, okay, I'm just, guys, tell me if I'm wrong. I need y'all in the chat, just correct the system if I'm wrong. I don't feel like that type of kid should be in a mainstream class then. They should be in a specialized, I know they have specialized class for that because I do recall um, teachers teaching in a, you know kids that have special needs and that are tend to be more violent I mean severely violent but they're like trained to handle those situations and they already know it's foreseeable they already taught certain um, methods to how to defuse those type of situations I feel like for a main a main classroom how can a teacher who's not trained to handle those type of uh, disorders how can she she'll have to spend all of her time trying to tend to that one student will where she's neglecting all the other students because she's so focused on trying to you know you know control the kid you know keep the kid from endangering the other students it's like it seems overburdensome and ineffective in a mainstream classroom i don't know let me know in the chat y'all because some people have more knowledge about this but let's keep reading so it says substantially impairs the person's capacity to make an informed decision regarding treatment. Okay. And this impairment causes the person to be incapable of understanding and expressing an understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of accepting treatment and understanding and expressing an, an understanding of the alternatives to the particular treatment offered after the advantages, disadvantages, and alternatives are explained to that person. Wow, that was a whole word scramble. They just seem like they use advantage so many times. <laughs> Has a reasonable prospect of being treatable by outpatient, inpatient, or combined inpatient and outpatient treatment. See, you see that? it has a It's saying inpatient or outpatient treatment. What is the treatment that the parents are giving for their children, it, uh, for this child? What type of treatment? Because her, the statement that the parents said does not indicate that they're actually giving any, the kid an outpatient or an inpatient treatment. This kid needs some serious attention, but not in a mainstream classroom like that, where the parent is constantly, or the teacher is constantly having to focus all of her attention on protecting herself and protecting her kids. That's just... Uh, this doesn't excuse what he did. I don't even know how the teacher in the school, sorry, I don't even know how the superintendent and um, the the higher ups would even permit this to continue to go, go on when she's been complaining about it the entire year. Why did it have to get to this point, guys? Why did this woman, this teacher who is, who is, you know, trying to do her job, why did it have to get to a point where she was shot and almost lost her life for them to actually react? That's unacceptable. She gave them all the warning signs several times. Oh 
Oh my gosh. Ugh. And then the family had the nerve to say they're committed to responsible gun ownership and keeping firearms out of reach of children. That is a lie. That language, guys, the firearm our son access was secured. Okay. That whole language right there was, was written by the attorney. That was written by the attorney. Everything that was on that little statement they wrote was written by the attorney. I highly doubt it. Okay. Now here's some details about where they claim this gun was, but this is some good information for us to know before we move on. But the part is saying if not treated has a substantial probability or likelihood of causing the person to suffer or continue to suffer severe, abnormal, mental, emotional, and physical harm or harming somebody else that significantly impairs judgment, reason, behavior, capacity to recognize reality. That sentence alone is very disturbing. That tells me that someone like that is unable to control their behaviors, unable to recognize right from wrong and can be very impulsive. So, you know, like this, for example, this child, very impulsive when he doesn't get his way or if he gets some form of discipline or told he can't do something, then all of a sudden he, be, he reacts in a violent manner because he's very impulsive and not able to control his behavior. That's what that tells me, y'all. Y'all let me know what y'all think because we're going to read some of you guys' chats because I'm really interested in what you guys have to say. But let's, before we get into that, let's read this first. This, um article i have here it's called the daily actually let me put it up here on the screen for y'all because i know y'all probably gonna be like i didn't get to read it okay here it is it's called the daily you getting off the screen little one okay it's called the daily and it says here right here it says the associated press by phone ellison this is the attorney for um the parents for this little six-year-old's parents he told the Associated Press by phone Thursday evening that his understanding is that the gun was in the mother's closet on a top shelf that was well over six feet high. The weapon also had a trigger lock that requires a key similar to a bike lock. Regarding how the child may have gotten access to the gun, Ellison said, we, do, we don't know. Um, regarding the disability, the family said the boy was under a care plan at the school that included his mother or father attending school with him and accompanying him to class every day. Okay, but here's the problem. They weren't, they, the school, the school officials, the superintendent, all of them involved who had this care plan, none of them were abiding by the care plan. Because if that really was the care plan requiring the parents to be there attending the class, every day accompanying the child well if that's the case why was the child the child allowed to go to that class without his parents the, co the child should have been set out of the class and said you cannot come to the class until your parent is here so i'm saying they were very careless in enforcing these care plans and other regulations they had at the school which is in my opinion makes the school very liable for this under a lawsuit i think abby should sue I'm really sad that she hasn't sued yet, y'all. I'm just like, girl, get your lawyer and get to get to suing. Yes, yeah, she sure does, Miss Helena. Miss Helena says she has a serious lawsuit. Girl, don't she? Don't she? She does. There's all that evidence that we just read about those witnesses saying she she warned. Hi, Stacey Nelson TV. She says, I truly believe that there are always warning signs before these school shootings. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And we just read up through a bunch of them. And the teachers, the school, the parents should be held responsible. Exactly. Hi, Bad News. How are you doing? Yeah, I agree with you, Bad News, that the parents definitely need to be held responsible. I feel like Abby should sue the parents because the parents already knew their child had behavioral issues. She should sue the school. <laughs> and she shouldn't go back there because they clearly don't care about her well-being. I believe he should have been enrolled in a school for kids like him. Exactly. That's what I was trying to say, Diane. Thank you, girl. They have classes. They have schools like this, though, because I remember I was actually going to um, go into that type of thing. Before I became an attorney, I was like a preschool teacher and they had certain um, classes you can take if you want to be a special needs teacher. And when they talked about all the violence those kids can can do and how they, they teachers have been stabbed with pencils and stuff, I was like, oh, I can't do that. I can't work in that area. And I was like, um no thank you i'll pass 
So I know they have schools for that. I don't know why they allowed this kid to go into a main school. Hi, bad news. Hi, everybody. Unguarded said, yeah, he heard that or possibly too much TV. Right, see, Unguarded Hour says that. He had to have seen this somewhere. But again, but again, we got to think back to what an acute uh, disorder is. And the acute disorder says, if not treated, has a substantial probability of causing the person to suffer or continue to suffer an abnormal mental, emotional, physical harm that significantly impairs judgment, reason, behavior, or capacity to recognize reality. So that would tell me that the, he's very impulsive. He doesn't recognize that what he's doing is wrong. He just feels like anything he's feeling inside, he can react upon. Jordan Turner says they probably thought there was no way in H-E double hockey sticks he would actually do anything at six years old. Right, that's what I'm thinking, Jordan. They probably was like downplaying what she said because they were like, come on, it's a six-year-old kid. The six-year-old kid is not going to do anything. Yeah, he's saying he's going to shoot you. What he going to do, get a water gun? So I'm thinking that's, I think you're right. The parents probably, or the teachers and the superintendent probably just didn't take him seriously. But that doesn't alleviate them of... That doesn't relieve them of liability. They're still liable under the law. And I feel she has a very strong, viable lawsuit. And I hope she considers that. She seems like a very sweet, forgiving young lady, but she needs to sue because they need to learn their lesson. And a lot of times these superintendents and other uh, staff members and those in higher positions, they don't learn, guys. They don't learn until they get some type of financial um, dent in their you know, pockets or you know dent in their reputation that's when they actually start changing the policies so that's why i feel like it's not for the money she would coop, recoup although she would need some money to get her back to you know where she was before the shooting but really it's to set a standard hopefully that will be um more protective of teachers in the future definitely more protective of teachers in the future. Hi, Laura Thomas. How are you, love? She says, this child is in need of some serious therapy. I hope he gets the help he needs. Right, Laura? I think he needs some type of inpatient treatment because he, he clearly is acting out very violently. And if he doesn't get some type of help, what if he would get mad at his, at his parents and turn around and shoot his parents? This case can get worse. They need to give him some type of inpatient treatment because they said individuals who have acute disability can either have an inpatient or outpatient well it seems like they've been they had a care plan but they're not abiding by that care plan so i feel like he should just go and have inpatient treatment okay jordan turner says some kids home life had to be insane right sorry she said that kid's home life had to be insane right right that's what i'm thinking jordan i feel like there's so much more to this case i am not buying the parents little fake um attorney written statement because i don't think they even wrote that and um, I really feel there's some toxicity in that family. Very a lot of toxicity in that family. And I'm wondering, I, go, I know a lot of people are gun owners, but I'm just wondering what made her go out and buy this gun when she knows her kid has an acute disability. That's a question I have too. You know your kid has an acute disability. There has been alleged complaints about your child throughout the year from, your te from the teachers saying that he has barricaded kids in the classroom. These parents knew that the kid had some behavioral issues. They're not surprised. They're not surprised at all about this. I mean, the parent, the teacher talks about how he he basically um, falsely imprisoned his the teachers and the, a teacher and the students and threw things. So, to me, the parents have already knew. So I feel like there is some toxicity in that household that the t the child is seeing, and so he thinks that it's okay to act violently. And also, in addition to his acute disability that he may have, also could have also contributed to his violent 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 and the, the violent um behaviors and outbursts but according to the authorities the authorities are trying to say there was no warning or struggle before the shooting occurred with the with the student opening fire with the 9mm Taurus handgun that's a lie because they said the staff members were uh, re reportedly alerted that the student had was carrying a gun so now they're trying to do this whole cleanup thing they're like oh well we searched the backpack it appeared there that he was unarmed. Well, where'd the little kid have the gun at then? Where he hide it at? I'm still wondering. I don't know. They said this kid was troubled, repeatedly um, made threats to hurt his teacher. This is all warning signs. 
and was which was reportedly ignored by senior members and school staff. I'm like, Zwerner needs to have that lawsuit ready. She needs to sue. I hope she sues. I know she's such a sweet lady, but sue, girl, sue. And Zwerner shared her fears, man, about the child's behavior with the administrators and asked for support with the boy and they ignored her. That is so messed up. So she had to get shot and almost killed for them to listen. That's just so sad. Oh, gosh. You got teachers who are witnesses saying she asked for help and they just nobody listening. Nobody listening to this woman at all. That's why I feel like, guys, I feel like the parents know something. I feel like there was some toxicity in that household. Um, I feel like the kid learned that violent nature from his parents he, and probably the things that he was exposed to watching certain violent things on TV. The parents let the little boy watch all that, thinking it's cool and laughing about it when the kid does things. And then I have, like I said, I have the subsequent question of why would a parent, knowing her kid has an acute disability, that he is he has a history of being very violent, why would she go and buy a gun? Doesn't that exacerbate the existing situation? <laughs> I don't understand. I get everybody wants their gun rights and all that, but I mean, like, come on, when you know your kid has some serious issues, make it make sense, especially when you're not responsible. She, They still claim that they put it up on a, a shelf that was six feet tall and all that. I think that's a lie. <laughs> I do lie. Laura Thomas says, I still want to know how he got the gun. Girl, that's what we all want to know. That is the million dollar question, Laura Thomas. How did he get a gun that they claim Let's read that again, what they claim, y'all. They claim up and down, y'all. They want to claim that they put this gun on a six feet, uh, a shelf that was six feet uh, high. How did the kid get it then? And then said they had a trigger lock on it. How'd the kid get the lock off? And then number three, the kid is a little thing. How is he going to be able to load the gun unless he was taught how to load a gun? talking about oh it was in the mother's closet on a top shelf that was well over six feet high the weapon also had a trigger lock that requires a key similar to a bike lock i don't believe that how did the kid get it then and how was it loaded all of that make it make sense and how the kid even learned that so good to see you stacy yes she should file a lawsuit you can you have to take threats seriously even from children exactly stacy and i think these superintendents and the administrators and all them they didn't take it seriously because it was a little kid a man in indiana was charged because his four-year-old was just holding what looked to be a loaded gun in their own home the parent should definitely be charged 1000 percent. exactly jordan turner how you doing sweetie exactly stacy tv nelson tv says wow that's sad the school failed the teacher seriously. Exactly, girl. I agree with you. Failed this poor teacher. Dis just ignored her. Uba, <laughs> Uba Stacy Nelson says she's not surprised. <laughs> Dang, really, Stacy? She said schools continue to ignore warnings. Really, Stacy? That is so sad. Well, they need to continue to get sued then. If they're going to continue to ignore warnings, then they should continue to get sued. Okay? Because the more their pockets are affected, the more likely they will start to heed to those warnings and stop ignoring the warnings. Sometimes you got to hit them where it hurts. You got to hit them in their reputation or you got to hit them in their pockets. That's the only way they're, the school administrators and all them will listen. Right. And the parents should be arrested. I wonder why it's taking so long. Laura said, what is acute disability? Honey bun, we just went over that. I don't know if this is an older um, post from you but we just talked about it and it is quite disturbing what it is so it does seem to suggest that he had a severe behavioral issue and he was unable to control it or even recognize reality so that's disturbing y'all that's what it is here on the screen if you want to read that again i'll let you uh go ahead and read that for yourself laura um Nelson says, Stacy Nelson TV says, yeah, the lawyer wrote the letter. Girl, exactly. Can you tell? Can you tell? It sounds so politically correct with the deep remorse and all that. You know they didn't write that, y'all. You know they didn't write that. The, if the parents had to attend school with the child every day, then that school is not an appropriate setting for them. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Canon 1964. 
best answer of the night. Exactly. If there's a red flag right there, if a parent has to sit there and with the class, this is a six year old kid. He should be able to sit in the class by himself. I understand if he's a, in preschool, cause I have, when I used to be a preschool teacher before I became a lawyer, y'all before my law career, the only time like teachers would stay, if it's like a preschool setting and the kids just now learning how to be in a classroom without their parents, then maybe the teacher, the parent would stay in there maybe for a few hours just to get the kid acquainted with the class. But this kid is now in first grade should already know how to be without their parents. So like Kanan said, if the child cannot, cause okay, think about it, Kanan. I agree with you hundred percent. Think about it. This kid is eventually gonna be in high school. So when he gets to high school, does the parent have to still come in the classroom with them? And then in college and throughout his whole life, the parents, come on now. No, this kid needs, to, that's not the appropriate setting for him. It's very obvious it's not. Cause what are they gonna do for the rest of their life? They're going to have to give up their jobs and everything to constantly be in class with him in every grade level. He's going to be a sixth grader with his parents sitting in there in the classroom. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. He should not be there. He needs to go to a class that's appropriate for him, a special needs class where the parent, the teachers are trained to handle problematic behavior like this, this impulsive like behavior for severe mental disorders, um, as we see here on the screen where you know this person the people have the instructor has to be trained to be able to handle this type of person with a severe mental disorder and that first sentence right there is disturbing come on like come on mm -mm. because in a normal setting like this the teacher is going to be overburdened with having to constantly monitor this one child they're not going to have time to be able to be an effective teacher for the overall class because they're and, and they don't have the training either just like Abigail kept telling them, she's like, please, you need to give him a special class. I, I can't really help this kid. And they just kept ignoring her. <laughs> They're probably thinking, oh, it's just another little six-year-old kid having a tantrum. It's all right. Just go back to class. Come on now, y'all. We live in a different age and time. This kid should be in a special class that the teacher is uh, trained to handle this type of mental disorder, severe mental disorder. That's what it says on the, sh the screen. Jordan Turner says, I don't know much about it, but acute disability seems to cover a wide array of mental disorders. And there is a very wide criteria for meeting those disorders. Exactly, Jordan. So we don't even know, like Jordan said, Jordan makes a good point. This persistent or, or acute disability, we don't know the narrow, the actual narrow disorder that he has, the, the specific one. This is just covering all forms of this disorders. It's just saying in general, you have a certain disorder. So we don't know the specific disorder that this child has, but the overall description of it still seems to be that the kid is more impulsive and reacts more violent and doesn't recognize reality, meaning doesn't recognize right from wrong a lot of times. Hi, Carla. Hi, love. Welcome to be in the chat. Happy Monday. Yes, it's called alternative school. Okay. Okay. I'm not. Okay. She found it. Thank you, Carla. That's where he needs to be. Thank you, love. Okay. So the school that he should be in, y'all, is called the alternative school. They have alternative schools for little kids and alternative school programs for troubled kids. Yeah, that's where he should be. Why is he in this school? He should be in an alternative school for the for for him for and a teacher's trained in that okay let's read what alternative school is y'all thank you to my lovely chat for helping assist out that's why we got to do this as a group because all of our knowledge and experience okay so this is the school thanks to again carla in the chat who helped us out here alternative school it's designed to educate students who have not been successful in regular schools often because of behavior, disciplinary, and safety concerns. This is the school he should be at. Do you see that? It just, everything I just read, I haven't even read the whole thing. And it described exactly the criteria for this little kid. Why hasn't he been sent to an alternative school before this happened? Clearly he wasn't able to behave um, safely in the school. He had a lot of safety concerns. He had behavioral issues and disciplinary issues, all three of them in one. An alternative school may involve a range of different educational settings other than the typical school. 
alternative schools are frequently used as an alternative to expulsion and suspicion. I mean, suspension. Many alternative schools have regular and special education programs and use building-wide behavior intervention programs. Often there is a lower student to adult ratio and staff have been trained, exactly, you see it right there, trained to address complex behavior needs. Psychologists, social workers, and psychiatrists may also provide services to students in alternative schools. This is where this little child should have been in the first place. He should have never been in a mainstream school. You see this right here. It says it's a lower student to adult ratio. That's the first thing that you need in this class because the teacher is gonna be dealing with a wide array of behavioral problem, problematic children. So she's, or he is gonna need to tend to those kids independently. So it needs to be, it's, a, it's gonna be a smaller class. And then number two, they are specially trained. They are trained to address these complex behaviors, how to diffuse the violent behaviors. This teacher, Abigail, didn't even have the training to do this. She's not trained to handle individuals that have this severe acute disorder. And I, I bet not find out that that kid went back to that mainstream school. They better not. They better not. They better. This kid needs to be in alternative school. He should have been there in the first place, y'all. It says alternative school provide educational options for students who are not successful in typical schools. Clearly this little kid is not successful. <laughs> He's not successful in typical schools, guys. He may look, you know, a little blurred, but he's probably a cute little thing. But look at his little hands. See, little, little hands. How are that little hands gonna get on a gun? He's so little. My gosh. That's probably why the administrator was like, that little thing can't do anything. Look, you just, you would never think a little little guy like that would, would be so violent. Okay? I'm still shocked. But anyway, let's get back to this because this is really helping educate us where this kid should be in the first place, an alternative school. Over the years, they have been viewed as schools where bad kids go, but that's not necessarily the case. Many students in alternative schools do not have behavioral problems, um, but this one does. <laughs> this little guy definitely has behavioral problems. However, that may have attendance, they may have attendance problems, need alternative school to get back on track. In some alternative schools, children attend to attend for the purpose of credit recovery. Once they earn sufficient numbers of credits, they were transferred back to a, a traditional school. No, we need him to be in that school indefinitely. Because if he has this acute disorder, he can't, he's not able to really function in a regular environment. It's gonna take way too much um too much time tending to this one little child so he needs to be in an environment where it's a small class a very small class um where you know the teacher is specially trained to handle kids with those behavioral issues and she can he or she can diffuse the violent outrage or outbreaks because he or she is trained to handle that our mainstream te teachers don't have that training and they don't have the resources to focus on a one little problematic child who has an acute mental disorder, severe mental disorder. Okay. Oh, so Miss Helena says it sounds like it could possibly be schizophrenia. Oh my gosh, that's scary. I hope not. I hope not this poor thing. He's gonna have a rough life. If the parents aren't helping him, that's what I mean. If he has schizophrenic, if he's schizophrenic, then they need to actually give him treatment. Like um, one of the individuals in the chat says that the parents are enablers. I agree with that. I think they're just enabling this kid. They're not even giving him discipline. They're probably congratulating him when he gets violent. Hi, Lakeisha. Hi, love. I love Lakeisha. She's always here. Hi, love. Thank you for being in the chat again. I appreciate you being here. She says the parents are enablers. So many red flags. That's what I feel. Because really, what kind of treatment? They want so bad for their kid to be in the normal school that they're literally sacrificing the safety of that school. They know their kids need some an alternative program. They already admitted it that he has an acute disorder, so or disability, acute dis disability. So that should give them red flags that he needs to be put in an alternative school where he can get the special treatment. He can have one-on-one, -on -one, a close engagement with a teacher that's specialized in training on how to be how to handle a problematic child. Okay. Like Helena said, he couldn't be mainstream. He can't. 
But I'm just frustrated with why did it have to go a whole school year? Why did it have to get to this point where Abigail almost lost her life and other kids could have lost their life just for the superintendent and everybody to respond? It shouldn't have gotten that far. That's what I'm saying. Right. Miss Helena says his parents are in severe denial. He couldn't be mainstreamed. Okay. They are in denial, but sometimes these parents, they're so, I, we talked about this before with Brian Koberger. A lot of parents are enablers. They want to protect their kids. Their kids can do no wrong in their, their mind. They can do no wrong. And even if they could see all the red flags right in front of their face that their kid needs help, needs therapy, needs, you know, inpatient treatment, they'll ignore it all because they want so bad. They want to say, my kid's normal. My kid doesn't need help. It's like a pride thing sometimes with these parents. It's like pride that they don't want to admit that their kid needs help. And I think that's true. That happened with my nephew, my older sister, she, my little nephew, he um, has a mental disorder, cute little thing. He has a little mental disorder, poor baby. And I remember when myself and my mom, we identified it when he was real little. We're like, we need to go get, see him to get assessed because it looks like he has a mental disorder. He would sit, he would sit on a couch and he would rock and bang his head on the couch or, or the, everywhere, everywhere he would go, he would just bang his head everywhere. He would rock and bang, rock and bang his head all day. That's all he would do. And we're like, something's not right. We need to, you know, get him assessed. And my sister was so prideful that she just would not do it. She would not go and get him assessed. I'm like, we need to get him assessed now so we can get him under treatment early while we we figured it out that something's wrong but her it was her pride that would not allow her to do it until finally she was forced to do it when the teacher said you need to go get him assessed it took an outside person telling her for her to listen so sometimes parents are so prideful they don't want to admit when their kid needs help or needs assistance and it, it, it makes things worse it only becomes worse for the child too Stacy Nelson TV says, I used to be a school secretary and nurse at a middle school where my daughter was attacked by a gang. I speak about it on my community wall. Oh, really? I need to take a look at that, Stacy. Wow, that is crazy. This our schools are not safe. Oh, thank you, Nelson. I love seeing you in the chat, Stacy Nelson TV. You're so sweet. Such a sweetheart. The people must have been afraid of him, right? Oh, sorry, the parents must have been afraid of him. Laura Thomas, right? Laura Thomas, the parents may be afraid of him. They may, that's probably why they spoil him. He's a little guy, but he's got a, a lot of force in him, apparently, to barricade and lock a teacher and kids in a classroom. That's a lot. At six year old, somebody had to teach him how to hold and shoot a gun, right, Diane? It's so sad that somebody at the school, as well as his, as well as his dropped the ball with his six year old boy. That's what I'm saying, guys. Like Diane said, the parents are lying in my opinion. I don't believe them or their attorney. Their attorney is paid to make up some or fabricate a defense. Whether it's true or not, they're gonna be paid to do what they gotta do, okay? Especially as a defense attorney, okay? So you can't believe nothing they say unless they have some true evidence of that. But even if they do, it's not a reasonable allegation that they had it locked up. How's a little child that little, okay? But like Diane said, how did this kid know how to shoot the gun unless they taught him? I think the parents, man, I wish there was more to find out about this household because I feel like the parents probably are a very toxic household. They probably are full of a lot of cussing and they embrace a lot of violence in the house. And they, are, they probably teach the little kid to engage in violence and they applaud him for his violent behavior. And so he gets a lot of positive reinforcement when he reacts in a violent way. And they probably sat and did teach him how to shoot the gun. Because how did he learn all that? He's six years old. Right, like Tavia said, supposedly the gun had a lock on it. Girl, that's a lie. <laughs> I'll tell the parents, boy, bye. Girl and boy, bye. Parents, bye. <laughs> Miss Elena says, hats, hats off to those those to dare to be a teacher these days. I know, Miss Helena, any age group. I thought it was just the older kids, but now you have to deal with safety concerns with the little babies. Stacey Nelson TV says, that's why I say the schools and superintendent do not listen to the warning signs. Exactly. You're right, Stacey. They don't, which is why they need to keep getting sued. <laughs> okay. They need to keep getting sued. I'm with Lakeisha though. I like Lakeisha's input about them being enablers. I really think that's the, the problem. 
Um, Kanan says he really needs a more restrictive special needs school. Right. Those are private and extremely expensive. Oh, that's probably why the parents don't want to bring them there because they can't afford it, y'all. The school system would be very, very likely end up paying for it. Okay. And that they, they don't want to pay. Oh, it's a money issue. Kanan, his is theory is that it's a money issue. You could be right, but think about it, Kanan. They're going to have to pay more if they get sued by Abby, or by Abby, who was severely injured and hospitalized because of their peer negligence when they could have just paid for the kid to go to the school in the first place. Okay, Kanan? So which one would, would they choose? They should have paid for this kid because it's less expensive just to pay for him versus now they're going to have to pay a hefty lawsuit if she sues, and I hope she does, not even just to get money, but to teach them a lesson more so and to be a deterrent for future teachers down the line. But it's going to be more expensive to handle a lawsuit because you have to, when it's a lawsuit, it's going to relate to all the future, the future costs of treatment also, and her emotional stress. Emotional distress is also going to be in a factor, a factor of analysis and punitive damages because they had warnings of this and they didn't heed to those warnings. So there's so much, it, there's so, there's a large way array of damages, financial damages that Abigail can likely retrieve. And think about it, a jury is gonna be more empathetic to her when she talks about how for a whole year she pleaded with the, the um, superintendent and the administrators, all the way up to two hours before she was shot, she was complaining, trying to tell them what's going on and about her safety concerns. And even the very day they ignored her and they weren't heeding to the care plan that they already had in place for the parents to always be in the class with this child, it's more expensive for the, the lawsuits more gonna be more expensive versus just putting that kid in a special needs class, an alternative school. So y'all, <laughs> that like Dan, Diane said, how is it that a six-year-old, we can't wrap our head around this yet. How is it that a little six-year-old boy, okay, this little six-year-old baby boy, how is he handling, holding and shooting a gun? unless he was taught that taught that by his irresponsible negligent parents who probably in my opinion they give him positive reinforcement for violent behavior probably they probably laugh when he curses because they think little kids are cute when they curse i know guys some toxic parents are like that y'all it's sad but there are parents like that they laugh at the kid when the kid curses or is violent i want to meet these parents these parents haven't spoke yet you can really, really, really assess a person's character by looking at them, assessing their, their body language and everything there. Um, and I want to see these people do an actual interview because I just feel, I feel that maybe this household, something tells me this household is a very toxic household. Okay. And this kid has been around a lot of violence and he's seen a lot of violence. Now he probably does have a mental severe acute, acute disorder disability, like they're saying, yes. But I, I feel like some of the things that happen in the household also are contributing factors. That's what I'm saying. So the kid already has a severe mental disorder. Now add that with a toxic, violent, prone household that's teaching this kid about a lot of violence and probably showing him how to hold a gun, all the stuff they're doing in that household. That just exacerbates his existing severe mental disorder. That's why I feel like something tells me there's something more to these parents. Something more to these parents, y'all. Is this child on any medication that could have added to his mental state? Oh, hi, um, Jen's Inverted Earth. Hi, love. Thank you for your input. I appreciate you. You know what? That's a good point. I didn't think about the medication aspect. I'm pretty sure if he has a severe mental disorder, they would have him on some form of medication. That is not too far-fetched to assume or to formulated opinion that he was on some type of medication. So they haven't given us details that he was on medication, but if the parents have already identified that he has a severe mental disorder, then it appears as though they already have been giving him treatment, which in my opinion, he probably did have some form of med medication. And like Jen said, who knows if that did add to his mental state? Because you got to also think about the side effects of these medications that these kids are giving. Because I know a lot of kids, when they have these mental disorders, they are given or prescribed medication to 
you know, kind of aid the kid and in, in their behavioral conduct. But I, I, that's a good point, Jen's inverted earth. That might be one of the reasons too. But again, he's probably been taking this medication for some time. The parents already know that he has a history of a lot of violent outrage outbreaks because otherwise they wouldn't feel, they wouldn't have a care plan requiring either the mother or father to be in the class with him, okay? If they didn't already know he had behavioral issues. So there's a whole bunch of issues with this. If they also knew that the medication was making his behavior worse, well then why didn't they go back to the doctor who prescribed it and said, you know what, this medication is making our child's behavior worse. When he takes this medication, he tends to out act more violent. Can you see if you can try an alternative or something else that doesn't exacerbate the existing behavioral problems he has? Again, it goes right back to the parents. It seems like these parents were, were very neglectful. This child probably was a huge burden on them. They didn't really put much emphasis on truly getting this kid the help he needed. He shouldn't have been in that school. He should have been in an alternative school. That's what makes me believe that the parents were neglectful and really truly giving this child the assistance and the proper treatment he needs and he should not have been in a mainstream school. But I agree with the um the um one of our subscribers here who said that they think the school didn't put this child in the alternative program because it's expensive and so they wanted to save money and cut corners. But if they want to do that now they're going to have to pay more money now. They would have had a cheaper route if they just would have put him in an alternative school in the first place. Okay. <laughs> right. Miss Helena, exactly. Miss Helena said, who can afford to be in school with their child every day? Exactly. Make it make sense. How are they able to work when they have to spend their whole day with the kid? That means it's going to hurt them financially. You know, rather, you know, instead of having to be in school every day with their child, why couldn't they just make sure their kid was in an alternative program? That would have alleviated both issues. <laughs> right, Stacey Nelson says, yes, we the parents want to see the parents. I know, I'll, I'll, or sorry, we the people, sorry. We the people want to see the parents. Right, I wanna see the parents because we wanna really sit and assess their behavior, their demeanor, because once you see them parents, we might be able to just assess that, okay, Look at how they're acting on this screen, y'all. We already know what's going on in that household, <laughs> which is probably why, guys, the attorney that's representing them is not letting them do interviews. Now, I get it. The attorney's going to say you should remain silent, you know, because you're possibly facing criminal charges. Yes, that is the default. But there are some there are some individuals who also they although they know they're facing criminal charges, they will um, accompany their their client to public interviews and they will just intervene if they feel like a question will um, incriminate them in any way. They'll just say, my client's not going to answer that question. You may ask the next question. So that is what the attorney can do. I've seen that happen a lot of times, you know, where, where attorneys um, have allowed their, their client to speak, you know, to the news but they will accompany them and they will just intervene or before the interview, they'll let them know these are the questions that my client is not allowed to answer. So do not ask them any questions. You may ask them the following questions. So that's what I'm saying. I just want to see these parents y'all because something tells me when we see these parents and we assess how they talk and act and their demeanor, we might be able to just <laughs> determine some of the underlying reasons why this kid is behaving the way he's behaving. Okay. And in addition to his mental disorder that's going on. Kana says, why didn't this child have an aid assi assigned to him? G good point. Good point. Because like Helena says, who can afford to be in, their cl the, in class with their kid every single day? I mean, how are you going to work? How are you going to put food on the table for your kid when you have to be in class with them every day? That, that, that affects their pocketbook also. So this is a very good point too, Kanan. I mean, I still think they should be in an alternative program, but if they couldn't afford it, they should have an aid assigned to him at all times. But an aid that is specially trained to handle a child who has these type of impulsive, violent, outraged um, 
or you know outraged or um, impulsive type problematic behaviors. That's the thing. They need to be trained. Right. Jen did have an excellent question, y'all. Y'all all do. That's why I love reading y'all's y'all, um, chat because you guys be make you guys get really great points. He possibly was on a new medication. Oh, Jen's inverted. That is a good. That is a good. Um, that's a good indication to consider if he was put on some type of new medication. Good thing to consider. We'll have to wait and see if they reference anything about medication. We'll keep watching the story to find out. The parent, but but here's the thing about that, Jen. Okay, if he was on a new medication, that doesn't explain the whole year of problematic behavior. This wasn't the first time he acted this way. The teacher, according to the articles we read, throughout the whole entire school year, the teacher, Abigail, who had been dealing with problematic behavior from this child. She had repeatedly talked to the administrator. She repeatedly, several times, talked to um, the superintendent about her safety concerns. Also, during that same school year, he barricaded the, the teacher and staff into a classroom. He was throwing things where kids were so terrified they were hiding under their desks. So it, it, to me, it doesn't, based upon the facts or the allegations that are alleged, it doesn't appear that he was placed on a new medication. So I think we can eliminate that. We can still consider that he may have had some type of medication, but I don't think it was a new one because this kid had been, based upon the information that's coming out from witnesses, from different teachers, staff members who witnessed it, they're all saying this kid was problematic the whole school year, y'all. The whole year, okay? And that the teacher had already tried to warn and that he had said he hated her. He wrote a note to her saying he hated her. And he brought the disturbing letter. And then the teacher, she brought that disturbing letter to the school administrators. And they just told her to drop it, according to the teacher, okay? Even though he wrote a letter, he wrote a note to her saying he hates her. This is the same teacher that was shot. He wanted to set her on fire to kill her. And she took that letter and she showed the administrator and they told her just to drop it and ignore it. That doesn't sound like someone who just had a new medication, y'all. And how did he manage to block a teacher and other students from leaving the classroom? And they were only freed after the teacher banged on the door and a colleague across the hall managed to get it open. No, this doesn't sound like someone who had a new medication. It sounds like someone who has ongoing, consistent behavioral issues. Okay, and she and this teacher had been repeatedly asking for help throughout the school year, they said several times. So I don't think we can, um, I don't think this, this situation is necessarily a new medication. It could be though, arguably that whatever medication he was on, that could contribute to his violent outbreaks, but it must've been something he was consistently on because he was problematic that whole school year. She was saying she had him in the class, okay? And that the and that the teacher um, was asking for him to get special t teaching that basically she couldn't handle him, and she was ignored. So yeah, I don't I don't think it's a new medication, but we can consider the fact that whatever medication he was on, girl, might have contributed to whatever was going on with his behavior. Okay, and maybe you see the it seems like this parents these parents are very neglectful. I mean, they don't even know how the child got the gun in the first place. That's just a, a cute, a, that's a clue, guys, that the parents are neglectful. So I'm thinking if it is somehow the medication that exacerbated this behavior, if that's the, the case, then whatever medication he had been on, he had been on it for quite some time. And the parents really didn't care to assess how it was affecting his behavior. I think they found the kid to be burdensome also, and they probably really didn't give him the true, um, treatment and attention he really needed they probably just let him do whatever he wanted because he probably would have these temper tantrums and violent out outbreaks towards them also and so for them to defuse the situation they just let him get whatever he want they probably just spoiled him rotten okay and then they probably laughed when he did act violent they thought it was cute and funny so he thought that that was acceptable in my opinion y'all okay the parents of his classmates may bring suit also. I'm sure they, they're traumatized. Right, Laura? I think everybody needs a suit. The kids for emotional distress, the other teachers for emotional distress, and Abigail. 
they just need to do a full class action lawsuit because those superintendents, the superintendent, the, the sorry, the superintendent, the administrators, all of them failed this school in general. Not only was the teacher scared of them, but the students were scared of this kid. Jesus. Jordan Turner says, yes, ma'am, most definitely contributing factors, probably like 95% household and 5% mental disorder, in my opinion. Right, Jordan Turner. I think you're right. I think there's multiple factors. And I, I agree, girl. I agree, Jordan. There's more to this story. We got to meet. We got to see these parents get an interview because I'm telling you, I know most of y'all, you guys are the opinionators. Y'all going to be able to formulate your opinion once you see the, the behavior of the parents. Why are they hiding the parents? I get that you're going to hide the kid. Okay, I respect that. But why are y'all hiding the parents? I really want to see these parents. Guys, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to try to look for these parents' Facebook, y'all. I'm going to see if I can find them Facebook because I want to do some more digging into the parents because I'm telling you, something tells me, guys, that the parents are a huge contributing factor um, like Jordan says. Okay. Jen, okay, Jen's inverted. Um, Earth says his adult adults failed him as well. Right, girl. Right. Exactly. And thank you so much, Jen, for giving us that input about the medication. Because I never would have thought about that. That is a great, um, that's a great point. Jordan says the answers to these questions are likely deep and dark and awful. Are exactly. That's why I feel like the only way we're going to get answers to this is if they file the criminal charges against the parents or there's a lawsuit. Because I want to dig into these parents' background. Now, something tells me, y'all, that the parents are a contributing factor. This kid wasn't just born violent, okay? He Even if he had mental disorder, he wasn't just born, you know, just to be that violent and, and get guns and think about setting people on fire. How would he How would he even think of the idea to set someone on fire unless he saw that on a movie? They talked about it, something. He saw it somewhere. How did he get the idea? The certain things that he's talking about doing. He's six years old. Did he watch a movie at the house where somebody was set on fire or there was a, fi a fire explosion, something? How does a little kid know these things? That's what I'm saying. It's the mental disorder, but it's you attach it, you attach it with the things that he's taught and his surroundings and the environment he's in. He doesn't need to be in that household. I hope they took him out of that household, guys. I know they said they were going to take him out of the household, but I hope they actually did because he doesn't need to be in there. Clearly those parents are neglectful, they're irresponsible, and they're sitting here lying on national television through their attorney because I don't believe their indications that the mother put the gun in the closet with a lock on, the trigger lock. I don't believe that. It's a lie because the kid wouldn't have got it. Look how little he is. He's a little thing. How is his little self gonna get um, to a high closet? Huh? Make it make sense. How? He's so little. Look at him. Look at his little hands. No. Mm -mm. I don't buy it, y'all. <laughs> I don't buy it. The children won't be charged. He may lose both. Yeah, he won't be charged, love. Yeah, that's what they already said. They're not going to charge him. But the thing is, I hope they charge the parents with something more than the misdemeanor that they have on the books currently. Because as it stands now, they only have a little lousy misdemeanor for this type of severe charge, this type of severe um, crime. The parents need to be charged with a felony, given the fact that Ab Abigail almost lost her life, y'all. She almost lost her life. And all those individuals, the administrator, the superintendent, these little boys, parents, all of them are responsible. They knew this was going to be something that would happen, especially the teachers and the superintendents. They were warned within a few hours before it happened that the kid had a gun. I, you know what I'm thinking, guys? I wonder, man, I wish, I wish Alyssa was here because she actually has grandkids that go to this school. Because my question is, you know when they searched his backpack and they didn't find the firearm? I wonder, do the kids have a little cubby or something? Because I wonder if this kid hid that gun in a cubby or somewhere else. Because if that's the case and the superintendent and the administrator failed to search other areas where he can store his belongings that was a negligence too because they should have, should have searched everywhere where he could store items and then the, here's a here's another thing this kid knows what he's doing he knew that bringing a gun to school was not acceptable which is why 
he took the gun out of his backpack when it was searched. So that to me shows some form of, of knowledge and awareness of the wrong conduct that he was doing because he actually took steps to hide the gun from the administrator or, or whoever was searching his backpack. He took the gun out. So that to me shows some thought processing there that he was aware what he was doing was wrong. He was aware that he should not bring a gun to school and that it's wrong to have a gun in his, his bag. Because why? otherwise, why would he have removed it? So that's a question I have. I wish Alyssa was here because Alyssa actually has grandkids that go to the school. And she can enlighten us on that. Alicia says, if the parents find a way to scam donations from this, I'm going to scream. Girl, you know they are, Alicia. You know they already have a GoFundMe somewhere. <laughs> I wish I knew the parents' name, but they're hiding that. So we don't know that stuff yet. If any of you guys know the parents' name, let me know because I'm curious to look them up. Okay. I'm looking at this article and this article does not tell me their name because I need to know what is this parent's background? What are their background? They're hiding these parents. I want to know who they are. They're adults. Now, I understand you want to hide the little child's identity. I respect that. It's a little baby. But I want to know the parents don't have a right to be anonymous. Okay. I guess they're going to, they're no longer going to be anonymous once they're charged. So I guess guys, we're going to have to wait until they're officially charged. That's why they're still anonymous because they haven't been charged with a crime yet. But I just have a question. Why is this attorney that's representing the parents? Why are they so adamant? Why is he so adamant in hiding their identities? Clearly he already knows there's some issues with the parents. <laughs> He already knows. He knows his clients are a hot mess. And he knows if they're they're uh, publicized in any way, it's going to give it away. They're going to act a hot mess on any interview. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's why. You have to ask that. Because an attorney can still protect their client's rights and let them be interviewed. And like I said, can monitor the questions that they're asked. That's okay. They could just say, hey, they're not going to answer that. They will answer this question though. So I just have a question for why, why is this attorney trying to hide these parents? I have questions, y'all. I think that attorney, no. <laughs> that attorney like, you don't say a word. Just be quiet. Let me handle everything. Let me write everything for you. Let me speak on your behalf because they already know the parents are a hot, complete tamale mess. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the teachers, uh, Kenneth Kenan said, the teachers made sure to document his behavior. I know that's good. It's good that all the other teachers have documented this kid's behavior. There's a whole paper trail of repeated attempts to warn and talk to the administrator about this kid throughout the school year. So that's going to be a solid lawsuit. All they have to do is just give the dates and times, what witnesses were there in each attempt to try to notify the administrator and the child's behavior. And that's going to be a pretty strong, solid lawsuit. I hope that, um, I really hope Abby sues guys. Oh my God. Another mass shooting in Cali right now as we speak. Exactly. Alicia girl. I haven't even talked about that one. I'm so conflicted y'all in talking about these mass shootings. Cause there's just so many, but yeah, there was a mass shooting in California at a, um, a little ballroom dance area. I guess the guy who did it, he, he took, I think he took his life in his white van, but Apparently he had gone to that dance hall and he was an instructor there and he met his wife there. So there has to be some underlying reason why he targeted that dance um, ballroom. Maybe they let him go or something and he was being re revengeful. But y'all, I didn't really want to talk about that, Alicia, because there's too many mass shootings, girl. I'm trying to talk about cases that, <sighs> there's too many of the same thing going on. Too it's sad that I have to actually, <laughs> I have to actually think about the stories I cover because there's just too many of it. You know, it's so sad. Why do I have to do that? Too many. Diane says, whoever, whomever has to take care of this little boy. Oh my gosh, Diane. Cause you know, girl, he gonna have to go to some type of foster care if they don't, they don't return him back to his parents. And like Diane said, whoever has to care for this little boy will have some patience, but he will most likely continue to have some type of issue when it comes to his mental health. Right. That's why I'm thinking he needs an inpatient treatment. He needs serious inpatient treatment. And I feel like these parents did not do this kid any, they didn't help this kid out at all, man. All they did was make this little, this thing worse for this poor little boy. 
man, I wouldn't be surprised if he was being abused because a lot of times when kids are abused, they learn that abuse or violence is the way to react when you don't like something. So I'm thinking he might've been abused in that household. And then he was taught that reacting in violence is the proper method when you don't like something. That can also be another consideration, y'all. Okay. Right. Like Laura said, <laughs> Laura Thomas said, how did his little fingers pull the trigger? <laughs> I know. I can't imagine, Laura. This is not funny, guys. I'm not laughing at this tragedy. I'm just laughing at the fact that, like Laura is saying, she can't really wrap her head around it either. Like, how does his little fingers pull the trigger? His little tiny little thing. Look how little little hands are. How did he garner the strength? He's so little. You can't be fooled by these little kids. My gosh. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, there's another one, Alicia. That's not the story. Okay, she said there's an even another one. Six more unalive. <gasps> Are you serious? We just had a shooting where 10 people were shot in California just this weekend. Are you saying six more people were just killed as we're talking? Oh my God, girl. And this, you know, California was the same place where they had that drug cartel shooting. Remember where the um, six people were unalived at the house and apparently it was a drug drug house or whatever. And people and the authorities think it was drug cartel. Are you talking about that one? Or are you talking about a whole different one? Girl, <sighs> my blood pressure. I can't take all this violence. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Oh Lord, it's another story, y'all. We need to, we need to uh, figure out some stories where it's positive sometimes because all we talk about, every time we talk about a story, y'all, somebody gets unalived or something. This is too much. I can't take it. I can't take it. But let me know what you guys think about this story. It's so sad. I feel like society has already failed this little six-year-old kid. His parents have failed him. His mama failed him. Everybody failed him. And just a disclaimer, his parents and the little boy, they're all considered innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. And all the information that we discussed is alleged and merely just opinions that we're talking about. No facts in any way have been provided, just allegations, okay? I know this is the sad part about it, guys, is this kid's future. He doesn't really have a promising future. Like Diane says, he's probably gonna grow up with major anger issues because he actually shot his teacher. This is sad, man. It's sad about the kid's future. Just thinking he might be, might grow up. And I don't want to speak this on a little kid, guys, because you want to think kids have such bright futures. You want to think, I believe the children are our future, like Whitney Houston said, teach them well and let them lead the way. But the sad part is they're not taught well, number one. I don't think they were taught well in the household. He was, he was not. But you just think, will he end up being the next Brian Kohlberger or Ted Bundy or you know, go out and just shoot a bunch of people. It's, it's a scary thing to think about that this little child, if there's no major intervention or something, he could end up being guys, the next mass shooter as an adult. And then later on, we come back and hear about this kid as a teenager going up and shooting up a school and killing. Like, it's just sad to think about that though, to really sit down and, and, think about it in a humble way that that this kid can end up being the next mass shooter he needs some serious help and i hope whatever wherever they take him that's the thing sometimes these group homes and foster care uh systems are no better no better he might i mean who knows wherever he goes guys is he going to experience more abuse wherever he's sent that's the other part about it yeah, Jen, he needs prayer. Like Jen said, he needs prayer. Yes, he needs prayer. And he needs a place where he's going to really get full treatment. Because it just makes me wonder, is he going to be, you know, that next person that ends up in prison for harming a lot of people? Because, my God, is he starting real young, guys? And he's our, he's threatening to set his teacher on fire and watch her die? And he's six? What is he capable of doing, doing when he's 10? 12, 13, 14, 15, 20. Oh, God, we might be looking at the next 
Ted Bundy or something. I don't know. I, I hope not. I hope not. I'm not trying to be negative, y'all, but I'm just saying it's very disturbing and just the lack of intervention. And I'm just worried about him going into the system. And I'm not sure if the system is going to be any better because, you know, you guys, we know we got to be honest. We hear a lot of disturbing stories about kids who end up in group homes, foster care systems. They end up getting abused by their the whoever's their foster care parent or whoever adopts them. So it's just the, it's the question of how do we know wherever he goes, he's going to truly get a treat the treatment he needs, because whatever he experiences in this, this uh, system, wherever they take him, they put him in foster care, wherever they put him. How do we know that's not going to make his situation worse? if he doesn't get abused or something in there and doesn't really get professional help because you think some foster care is going to want to pay for this kid's medical help and, and out inpatient treatment. They're not going to, you know, the government's cheap as it is. They're not going to pay for that. So what that tells me is he's probably going to be just put in a room with a bunch of other problematic kids and just neglected, which means he doesn't get any treatment, which means it only makes him worse and having to, to defend himself from other problematic kids will further strengthen and embolden his violent tendencies. So guys, this is more serious than we think, guys. That's the thing. A lot of people were celebrating that this kid was taken from the parents, but how do we know, y'all? How do we know? How do we know this is gonna really help? Mm -mm -mm. that just made me hit reality y'all I had to stop and think about that and that really made me hit reality I just kind of oh my god and like like Sylvia says early treatment is vital and I just don't I don't see I don't see a group home or foster care making this any better I don't I don't see them really helping this kid they're just going to look at him as a bad kid and just throw him away into the system with a bunch of other bad kids quote unquote guys I'm just saying quote unquote okay that's what they see these kids as and they see these kids as burdens. So they just throw them in a big room with all the other problematic kids and they just feed them and that's it. They feed them and house them, but they don't really give them treatment. They don't really help these kids get the help they need. A lot of them have a lot of mental disorders in these group homes and foster care systems, but they don't, they don't give these kids professional help. They don't care about these kids. All these kids are is a number to them. And they want to get these kids out to a foster parent. They don't really care what, whether the foster parent is safe or not yeah they do those little inspections but sometimes they don't we already know that because we talked about a story like that recently y'all on my page with the couple that was molesting their two boys so and that um it was a christian organization that just skipped all these procedural steps and just let these kids go into this household that uh endangered these poor little kids and violated their purity and all kinds of stuff had these kids doing so it's just like y'all like i'm at first I was happy about the kids being taken from the parents, but I'm really thinking it's not gonna make it any better, guys. It's not gonna make it any better. They're gonna just see this kid as a bad kid, throw him away, put him in a room and neglect him and just, you know, give him some uh, discipline whenever he's bad, lock him in a, what do they do? Lock him in a little cage in a dark room when they're bad and that's it. I don't know what they do with kids in group home. I know they do that for jail people, but I don't know what they do when kids are are um, bad in group homes or foster care programs. But whatever they do, they put them in some whatever discipline area and that's it. But he doesn't just need discipline. He needs professional help. He needs like a, I think he needs an inpatient treatment with, you know, uh, experts to figure out what's a proper medication for him to be on that doesn't exacerbate his violent tendencies that actually help um, minimize his violent outrage and outbursts and that he has people specialized to help him with help him control those behavioral impulses but that's not what he's going to get in those those foster homes guys he's not going to get that this is going to make it worse that's just my opinion y'all sylvia says medicaid will pay for his treatment if placed in foster care okay well i pray you're right sylvia you might be right okay you might be right, girl. I pray you are right. That's all I can do. Oh, Miss Helena says she lived in a group home. What was it like, Helena? Okay, Miss Miss Helena says she he will probably be institutionalized until he's twenty one. Oh wow. Okay. What was it like living in a group home, Miss Helena? Because maybe she could shed light on what it's like there for kids. Like, did you see any kids in there that had kind of mental disorders like this kid, and did they actually give him help? 
did they give those kids help when you saw that type of behavior that's cool to know somebody you know knows what it's like i mean it's not sorry it's not cool that you're in a group home sweetie but i'm just saying at least you know the the um you have experience that you can help shed light on oh gosh guys it's just it's just sad but maybe helena can shed light and let us know um oh she said not me him oh okay i thought you said you was in a group home girl let me see what she said let me read it. then leave oh sorry <laughs> sorry i must have misread what you said love she said then live in a group home she said he'll probably be institutionalized until he's 21 then live in a group home okay sorry miss helena i thought you said you were in a group home okay never mind i was just i thought maybe somebody who knows what it's like to be in there but that's what i've heard i know of people little kids that were in group homes my sister was because she was bad my mom put her in a group home before and she told me it was it was very horrible in there it was awful in there they don't get you know special help in there and stuff like that they just get neglected thrown into a room or whatever so my sister was bad growing up y'all she was in and out of group homes that girl was either in juvenile or a group home or something and she said it was not a good experience that's all i could really know about it we have to advocate for them it doesn't have to be the way it is we need to stop sweeping things under the rug i agree sylvia we need to stop neglecting our kids this is so frustrating like i see a lot of latchkey kids even around where i reside there's always these kids that are neglected they don't get a lot of treatment where i'm at and i see all these kids just roaming around the parents don't spend time with them give them love and affection and the treatment and where, where we live, it's not an area where kids should be playing outside. You know, it's not. They should be taken to a park where they can enjoy themselves and play. But the parents work, that I know of are very lazy. They don't want to even walk down the street. It's only like five minutes, y'all, at this park. They don't, they're so lazy <laughs> that they don't want to walk their children to a park that's five minutes away. So it's just sometimes parents, they don't want to invest in the time. And I'm not saying that's for all parents. I'm just saying a certain population of parents. So I'm saying a certain population of parents. They don't want to invest in their kids. They just neglect the poor kids. And like Sylvia said, we need to advocate for them because although the kid has some issues, y'all, he needs some professional help. He doesn't need to be thrown into a group home, neglected and just treated like he's trash. Somebody needs to intervene and help him while he's little. There's a chance that we can help this kid. There's a chance he's six years old. If, they, if he gets the true help he needs, the inpatient treatment, the proper medication, the therapy, whatever he needs, they can actually help this kid, but I feel like all they're going to do is see him as a bad kid. And then what do they do with bad kids? They just punish, 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 throw him away, neglect. And that's just going to make it worse till he eventually turns into the next Ted Bundy. Or whatever killer you can put in the fill in the blank, you fill in the blank, whatever your, your killer you know about. The next whatever, the next BTK, whoever, I don't know, you guys name the next person. But if he doesn't get the help he needs, that is the route we're going to be seeing him. And in a few years, this little kid is going to be back in the newspaper and they're going to say, several years ago, this same child shot his first grade teacher and now he blew up the whole Walmart. Okay? That's what I'm saying, y'all. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Miss Elena's like, not me, him. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Helena, girl. Sorry. <laughs> you are too cute. She's like, hold up. She had to do it twice. <laughs> let me, let me. She was like, no, you got it wrong, girl. <laughs> Sometimes foster homes make kids with mental... Right. This is where it is right here, like Diane said. Sometimes foster homes make kids with mental problems worse. It's true. Time and time and time again, we see these stories. I know you guys have seen these stories where these kids... When they come out of foster homes, they're all messed up because of the repeated abuse they go through. Because the first time he does wrong or act out, the outcome will be bad, right? He's gonna get this horrible punishment instead of him getting mental help. He clearly has an acute disorder. He, does, he needs some mental help, okay? He needs some professional help. A professional who is trained to treat severe mental disorders, especially he's six years old. There's just an opportunity to really help this kid. He's six years old. It's perfect timing. But I highly doubt in the foster system he's going to get it. I think I think they're going to just throw him away and treat him as a bad kid and just use the, you know, a, a, they're going to use punishment instead of professional help to to um, control this kid's behavior, which is going to make him act out more, basically. 
Jen says, my brother was put into the foster system at 12 and was abused. Oh, see, this is sad. And he found, and he found me as an adult. He came to visit me in 2011 and he, and <gasps> no, guys, her brother took his own life at her house and never recovered. See guys, this is what happens in the foster system. I'm so sorry, Jen. I am so sorry, love. That's what happens to a lot of kids in there. And like Jen said, they never recover. They end up just so messed up as adults because of the repeated abuse as kids and the constant neglect. Um, I knew of a girl who was in the foster care. She was molested by her foster dad, repeatedly molested. It was so bad, man. I'm sorry, Jen Inverted Earth. This is so sad. I didn't I didn't see it going that route. I, I mean, I thought she was gonna talk about a bad experience, but he took his life. Oh no. And at your house. Oh my gosh. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, Kanan said it right here. Kanan said, I bet that's why parents were in school with him every day. They know what the system will do to him. Exactly right. They do because they use a lot of um, punishment, but this kid needs actual therapy. He needs somebody who's a, who's a professional, who knows how to handle individuals with that behavior problem. And what they do is they teach the child or the individual how to make alternative decisions when they don't like certain um, situations. Instead of reacting violent, they'll show them, okay, no, you can react this way. You can use your words. You can tell someone you don't like the way the person made you feel. Instead of throwing the toy, you, can tell the person that what they did made you mad because the problem was when the kids have these mental disorders, they don't know how to use their words. Okay. A lot of times they don't know how to use their words. So they use their, their behavior. They use their actions. They use violent. They'll throw something. They'll scream. They'll jump. They'll do whatever. So like whoever's trained, they will show them other alternative methods to cartel or to, um, control or bring cartel. What did I say? What did I say? Sorry, y'all, it's getting late. It's getting late. I just got back from a 10 hour work shift, so I'm that. Um, they, <laughs> what did I say? They will use, they'll teach certain methods for the children to learn how to find another alternative method to how they behave versus a violent reaction instead of just punishing the kid because that's going to make it worse. You just punish him. That's not going to fix the situation. So that's what I'm thinking in this household. What if he was getting beat every day when he was bad? So if you're getting beat every day when you behave wrong, well then the child's gonna think, oh, okay, so whenever I don't like something, I need to beat my teacher. I need to shoot my teacher. I need to set my teacher on fire when I do something because that's what my mom does. She beats me and she does these things to me when I'm bad. That's what I'm saying when a kid has a mental disorder. So I highly doubt even the parents were really being any help to this kid with these mental disorders. I highly doubt it, y'all. I highly doubt it, y'all. Ugh, okay. Oh no, and she said her kids were small and they needed mental health. The kids knew about it? No. Oh, that is so sad, Jen. It is sad. And I wish stories like that is more publicized so we could talk about it and give those individuals a voice because a lot of times those kids don't feel wanted, they don't feel loved, they don't feel cared for. And they just wanted people to listen and care for them. And they feel so trapped inside from all the turmoil that they dealt with. That is so sad, Jen. Oh, I just express my empathy for you and your family love. I do a lot of um, stories like that on here too, Jen. So if you ever want to share, we could maybe do a story, talk about him and his life and his memory to um, raise awareness because it's so sad, man. It's such a sad thing. All right, guys. Well, this we talked enough about this story, but we are going to keep... We're going to really, really keep um, updates on this story. I'm really waiting for those parents. I'm going to be trying to figure out if you guys find out before me, I want to find out who the parents are because I want to look into their behavior. Okay. If, if, on, if on their Facebook and social media, they're out here waving guns and acting a fool, then you can see where the kid was getting it from. Okay. That's really what we need to look at too, is what the behavior is. Right. Or Jen, if you don't mind, I mean, it's up to you. I know this is an emotional topic. Okay, love. I know it is. And I'm so sorry. But if ever you feel comfortable and you ever wanted to share your brother's story, I can even invite you to the platform. You can submit pictures to me. We can share the photos, whatever. And just have a healing uh, live because I, a lot of the stuff I do on here too is for mental health too. 
and individuals who've took their life and to share their stories in their voice to give them a voice on the platform. So if you ever feel like you want to be able to share your story, I'll let you even come up and we'll invite you up and you could talk about your brother, you know, what he meant to you, maybe share with us who he was, stuff, you know, just get to know who he is and stuff like that to show how special he is. And like you said, it, it could be very therapeutic and healing to you to just talk about it. You know, a lot of times just talking about it with others and um, also raising awareness to people who are dealing with mental health or trauma, because a lot of people come to these videos and they're, they're thinking about taking their life and they could maybe hear about your brother and, and maybe that might save their life. You never know. You never know. That's why we talk about those stories because we create a safe place for people to come and talk about that very sensitive, very, very sensitive topic. So it would be nice actually for you to talk about it. It'll actually give you a better um, safe place to express it. And you'll be surprised how, even though, It'll never fully heal you, but it's just it's a it's a way to give you a little bit of comfort to talk about your brother. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you don't ever get to a lot of times it's not comfortable to talk about it. But if you have a safe place to do it and a lot of these subscribers on here, they're very empathetic and caring girls. So you don't have to worry about anybody judging you on here. All the subscribers I have, they're they, they're very understanding. So you're safe here, girl. And I only keep it on subscribers only. So we're not going to have little outsiders coming into our chat acting a fool. Or they'll be blocked, okay? They'll be blocked. Okay? <laughs> All right, guys. I love y'all so much. Again, and let me know if you guys have any stories. And like, Jen, if you guys have any stories you want to come up and talk about, I'll even have you come up and you could talk about your story and share on the platform. We'll also have that too. Okay? All right. You, oh, I love you, Jen. She said, that's why I felt comfortable to bring it up. You have such a wonderful audience. Oh, we love you, Jen. You're our family, girl. We love you. We're all family here. And all my subscribers, they know about these type of stories. So they're very caring people. Okay. Everybody in here, you safe here. You are safe here, love. Okay. We love you, girl. We love everybody in the chat. So if you need anything like that, you let me know. Um, the way you can reach me too, because I don't do I don't do email anymore because I have some crazy people in here, y'all. You can e you can um message me on my Instagram. It's Queen Esquire Gal G A L, and just message me there, girl. If you ever want to do a story, and we'll it'll be your full platform. We'll just add you on here, and you can talk away, girl. You could if you want me to use pictures, you can send me the pictures through the Instagram, and I'll put them up on the overlay. You know, when you let me know when you want me to post a picture while you're talking, say, hey, could you post this picture or whatever? And I'll post the picture as you're talking about it because it really will be healing. It really will be. All right. All right. That's what this. Oh, I love you, Sylvia. Yep, girl. I'm here. Y'all let me know if y'all want to share a private story about a family member, a friend, because the thing that's frustrating to me, y'all, and I don't know about, I don't know about y'all, but a lot of time these mainstream outlets, they don't give people a lot a lot of coverage about stuff like this so why not use youtube to talk about it talk about stories that are not just on the news but stories that you guys have yourself you guys might have a family member that went through something and you want to come on the platform to talk about it so you can help other people who are dealing with that or you know maybe a life lesson that you want to help educate people about why not just use youtube to do that okay okay all right. Love you guys. Have a good day. Have a good night. It's probably a night time for y'all. Have a good night, y'all. Take care. Toodaloo.